Second half of July, 1941. Your country is at war and you're a civilian. You find yourself caught up in the crossfire between the two sides. Is it still clear to you who the enemy is? Now imagine that both sides start destroying your home and your food, and both sides try to kill you. By now, it should be pretty clear that to them, you're the enemy. That's a situation of anyone stuck in the battle zones in China and the Soviet Union at the end of July, 1941. This is War Against Humanity, a sub-series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. At the beginning of July, as the German invasion of the USSR was picking up speed, the NKVD raced to kill as many of their political prisoners as they could. The SS Einsatzgruppen, the Wehrmacht and the Romanian army began their mass murders of Jews and communists with the help of local Poles, Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Romanians, Latvians and Estonians. And Stalin declared a war of extermination in response to Hitler's war of extermination. And as July comes to an end, the war in the Soviet Union is increasingly being fought by both sides at the expense of the population there. In the countries already occupied by the Nazi German Reich, the oppressive German vices are tightening as they round up more and more undesirables. The collaborative regime in France is doing their best to help them. The new Croatian state continues its program of mass murder in what was until recently Yugoslavia. Poland is now being pulled into a greater context of terror as they end up inside a greater region of Nazi violence. But all over these regions, parts of the population is starting to respond with more resistance. In the Balkans, Tito has formed his partisan movement. The Serbian Chetniks are coalescing into an active militia. In Poland, the resistance is increasingly active. Espionage and resistance is picking up speed in Norway, the Benelux countries and France with support of the British Special Operations Executive. I will be covering all of that in the second installment of our resistance series here on War Against Humanity in the next weeks. In the Mediterranean region, the Soviet Union and Germany, the civilians are caught under a rain of bombs as the opposing air forces use strategic or tactical bombing campaigns over their homes. And in China, it is no different. Ever since Chongqing became the provisional Chinese capital in 1937, when the Kuomintang leadership moved there following the outbreak of the Sino-Japanese War, Japanese bombers have been raining bombs on the capital. The bombing campaign was designed to destroy the entire city to kill civilians and to lower Chinese war support. Between 1938 and 1943, with practically full air supremacy, 268 air raids are or will be executed, carpet bombing Zhongqing, killing more than 11,500 civilians in that city alone. Almost 10% of these raids, 20 in total, are made on the 5th of June 1941. In barely three hours, they pour down hundreds of their incendiary bombs and bombs with a delayed fuse. One of them hit an air raid shelter where the sources differ. Between 1,000 and 4,000 Chinese civilians die from asphyxiation. And across many parts of China, the same pattern follows. The US formally protests the Japanese raids on Chinese civilians and the raids decrease for a few days, but Japanese bombing resumes in full force later that month and continues now in July. All of this is part of the Japanese doctrine to meet any resistance to occupation with Sanku Sakusen, the three alls policy. It is an order to kill all, burn all, and loot all, installed in the Japanese army already in 1938 with Emperor Hirohito's consent. Since then, it has been endless suffering by imperial decree for the Chinese people caught behind any advance of the Japanese front lines. And this suffering is only getting worse as the Japanese army is increasingly frustrated by the lack of progress in the war, with stiffening resistance by both Chinese nationalists and communist forces. Now in July, General Yasuji Okamura is made Commander-in-Chief of the Northern China Area Army. While leading the 11th Army, Okamura is the one who ordered the use of chemical weapons during the battles of Wuhan, Nanchang, and Changsha, again with the consent of Emperor Hirohito, according to historians Yoshiaki Yoshimi and Seiya Matsuno. 
Okamura is now hell-bent on breaking the back of the Chinese opposition, and his tool will be the Three Alls policy. As we shall see in the next years, it will be an orgy in blood and fire that, according to historian Himeta Matsuyoshi, will cost more than 2,470,000 Chinese non-combatants their lives with multiple Sanko operations, far superseding the more infamous rape of Nanking from 1937 and 1938. The Chinese civilian population is also being attacked by their own forces, who are also pursuing massive operations of burning crops, homes, even entire villages, to ensure they don't fall into the hands of the Japanese. These kind of attacks from both sides and civilians in China is even the origin of the term for these kinds of actions in English, scorched earth policy, which appears for the first time in print in a 1937 report on the Sino-Japanese War. It is a direct translation of the Chinese phrase Chiao Tu Chongche. And much further to the West, it is now the Soviet population that will suffer the same way under their own armed forces and the German invaders. In his radio speech to the Soviet citizenry on July 3rd, Stalin said, All valuable property, including non-ferrous metals, grain, and fuel that cannot be withdrawn must be destroyed without fail. In areas occupied by the enemy, guerrilla units, mounted and on foot, must be formed. Sabotage groups must be organized to combat enemy units to foment guerrilla warfare everywhere. Blow up bridges and roads, damage telephone and telegraph lines, set fire to forests, stores and transports. In occupied regions, conditions must be made unbearable for the enemy and all of his accomplices. They must be hounded and annihilated at every step and all their measures frustrated. While that might be an effective way to negate the Germans a strong foothold, it also means that Stalin's own population, caught up on the front lines, now face certain destruction. To not fight but flee is treason, which is punishable by death. To stay will either mean that you die at the hands of the invader or risk death by starvation if that invader doesn't choose to help you. As the German army approaches, many choose to fight, even those that Stalin perhaps suspects the most of being on the side of the invader, the Volga Germans, who have their own autonomous republic, the Volga German ASSR. On July 13, 1941, they form a militia of over 11,000. The same day, the chairman of the Supreme Council of Volga German ASSR, Konrad Hoffmann, and the chairman of the People's Commissars of the ASSR, Alexander Heckmann, speak directly to the Soviet German people on the Soviet broadcasting system. Heckmann calls to arms. Soldiers, workers, farmers, the intelligent of Germany, do not spill your blood for Hitler's criminal goals. Turn your arms against your mortal enemy Hitler and his bloodthirsty band of violators. Only after the defeat of Hitler and his horde will you be able to have a life of freedom and happiness. Down with bloody fascism. Stand up and fight for a free Germany. Over 2,500 Volga Germans voluntarily enlist in the Red Army and another 8,000 join militia units and now play an important role in the defense of Brest and other key battles. And across many parts of the Soviet western lands, this is the rule. In the regions forcefully annexed a year ago and anywhere, once the Germans arrive, the story becomes a different one. Here, these militias turn out to be as much the enemy as the invader and many choose to flee after all. Johan Jaik, an Estonian, writes at the time, These days, bogs and forests are more populated than farms and fields. The forests and bogs are our territory, while the fields and farms are occupied by the enemy. Now, by enemy, he doesn't mean the Germans. He's speaking of the Soviet forces. In his book Inferno, Max Hastings tells, one of the Red Army Commissars, Nikolai Moskvin, wrote, It's not surprising that local people run off and complain to the German. A lot of the time we're just robbing them like bandits. The struggle for survival in a universe in which the occupiers controlled most of the food caused many women to sell their bodies to Germans and many men to enlist as auxiliaries of the Wehrmacht. Heavies, as they became known. 215,000 Soviet citizens died wearing German uniforms. But the vast majority of Soviet citizens will find no friends among the Germans. The goal of the invasion is far more than a strategic military strike to settle with a potential enemy. 
Nazi war machine is here to fulfill the fantasy of Lebensraum for the German people. Their methods will be ethnic cleansing, enslavement, and genocide. It is Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler and SS Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich who are in charge of these programs. Since May 1940, for over a year, Himmler's Planungsamt and Heydrich's Planungsgruppe 3b have been working together with the Institute for Agriculture and Agrarian Science at the Friedrich Wilhelm Universität in Berlin to devise a comprehensive and detailed plan to create space for German eastward expansion and colonization. They plan to exterminate or remove 80 to 85 percent of all Poles and 50 to 75 percent of all Czechs, exterminate 50 to 60 percent of all Russians in the European part of the Soviet Union and remove another 15 to 25 percent to Siberia, exterminate 25 percent of Ukrainians and Belarusians and remove 30 to 50 percent of them to Siberia. The remainder are either judged to be Germanizable or will serve as undereducated slaves to provide for the master race. The plan also provides for the kidnapping of children that have the characteristics of Germanness, of racial lunacy the Nazis so love. The timetable to get this done is two decades so that a racially pure German Reich stretching from the Atlantic to the Ural Mountains will be a reality by 1961. Before May 1941, the method for this extermination program is not quite clearly defined, not in the Generalplan Ost, but genocide by starvation is one of the suggested methods. And such a plan to starve the occupied Soviet population and POWs to death has already been devised under leadership of Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring. On July 18, 1941, German Führer Adolf Hitler orders the creation of the Reich Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories and puts it under the command of Alfred Rosenberg, one of Hitler's longest political companions and an ethnic German originally from the Baltic region. Rosenberg appoints the creator of the hunger plan, Herbert Backe, to implement it as Staatssekretär of what will soon become the Reichskommissariat Ukraine. Backe, born in Batumi, Georgia, is like his boss, an ethnic German Eastern European. He is also a close personal friend of Heydrich, like all of the involved. He is a doctrinaire race ideologue with deep-seated, violent, anti-Semitic, anti-Slavic and anti-Bolshevist hatred. The plan is a detailed operation, but fairly simple in its nature. The Germans are just going to go ahead and steal all the food. Anyone they incarcerate, like Jews, POWs, Sinti, Roma, or political prisoners, will be given starvation rations. In combination with the Soviet scorched earth policy and with the militias also pillaging their way through the countryside, this spells disaster and death on a monumental and terrifying scale. The implementation of the hunger plan starts immediately. And already by the end of July, there's nowhere near enough food for the population stuck in the occupied zone. As we have seen, extermination by starvation is not fast enough for the Nazi desire to kill the Jewish minority. The spontaneous pogroms by local Nazi collaborators continue. The Einsatzgruppen are now carrying out mass execution of Jews across the land. The Wehrmacht and their allies are either killing any Jews they encountered themselves or turning them over to the SS. And any Jews that manage to not end up immediately in front of a machine gun are being hoarded together in ghettos to be starved. Any Jews that are able to join the partisan militias to fight back do, but that too is often just a reprieve as the Wehrmacht and the SS hunt the partisans down, killing scores of them both in battle and reprisal actions. Red Army soldiers taken prisoner are often forced to drop their trousers to show if they are circumcised, and if they are, they are shot on the spot. The death toll is already in the tens of thousands. It's chaotic, erratic, and anything but systematic mass murder. Nonetheless, it has given the Nazi leaders the push they were looking for to find an answer to the Jewish question. And thus, as we saw in this week's weekly episode, Göring orders Heydrich to find a better, more efficient way to kill the Jews on July 31st. 
So as August 1941 rolls around, the war is just getting worse and worse. If it was millions of civilians caught in the killing zones, it is now tens of millions. While militias and resistance networks rise up against the enemy across the occupied lands, the scorched earth policy of the USSR and Chinese forces are killing their own population. The Germans have started starving the entire westernmost Soviet population under their control, and the Japanese are doing pretty much the same to the Chinese in their zones of control. In Romania, Poland, Ukraine, Belarusia, the Baltic states, Jewish people are being singled out to be murdered by the tens of thousands. And when it looks like it couldn't get any worse, Japanese General Ukamura and German SS Obergruppenführer Heydrich have just received orders to find ways to turn up the pace and efficiency of the killing to gargantuan proportions. What is it like to live through this? To face the reality that no matter what you are going to do, there is a near certainty that you or many of your loved ones will die. Chances are you have lost everything, your home, your belongings, your life's work. Everything you have achieved until now is gone. There is no one you can turn to, no one that will protect you. Your only choice is to hunker down and hide or degrade yourself by selling your body, your soul to the enemy. And who is that enemy? Some young boy trembling with fear of death or fear of having to dole out death. You're in a hole, either literally or figuratively in a deep, dirty hole in the ground. War has reduced you to an animal. You have nothing, nothing except hunger, fear, suffering, and death. I can only hope that looking at these horrors helps us to avoid repeating the errors of our forefathers. To do that, we need to understand as best we can things as they were while avoiding the ideological blindness that plagued this conflict. Here at Time Ghost, we do our best to document history simply as it was, free of ideological presumptions and without an agenda to promote simple solutions. Become a part of this effort by joining the Time Ghost Army on patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Never forget.